name is Wendy Pearson. I'm a professor of equine physiology in the Department of Animal Biosciences here at the University of Guelph. I'm happy to have the opportunity to join the College Royal uh, Lecture Series, and I'll be talking for about the next 45 minutes or so about feeding horses and how our feeding strategies change as we move from spring through summer and then to autumn and winter. I'm just going to share my screen here. So as you can see, we uh, we have quite a changing environment for a lot of horses, as uh, particularly those who live, you know, here in, in southern Ontario, we have a very diverse climate and that climate has a pretty major impact on not just in terms of what the horse needs from a nutritional perspective, but also from what is provided to them as as the um, as the circumstances change as the seasons change. So in terms of general feeding philosophy, um, you know, if you, if you kind of think about what is the single most important nutrient for a horse, and many of you may come up with, you know, maybe it's hay, maybe it's, I don't know, treats. <laughs> um, but in fact, the single most important nutrient for a horse is water. Okay, so that's number one. Um, but then the next most important um, feed ingredient for horses is forage. So whether forage comes um, as in terms of hay or if it's pasture, um, it, it really is the most important um, fiber is really the most important nutrient next to water. So these two nutrients, the fiber that the horse gets from forage and, and the water, these are absolutely essential for gut health. So horses cannot function um, effectively. They can't stay healthy if we don't always, in under all circumstances, provide fiber and water. So at various times of the year, these can be actually quite challenging, right? Because if you think about, you know, the, today, right now it's minus 16 degrees outside and so water can be a bit of a challenge so depending on what the season is we we have different challenges that we have to address so what i'm going to start off with is just looking at kind of basic feeding philosophy for horses and then we'll kind of modify that as we move through the seasons so in terms of the basic requirements on average horses need to eat approximately two percent of their body weight every day so if we consider the sort of the you know the average 500 kilogram horse for example if if that horse is eating two percent of his body mass um so that we do this little calculation 0 0.02 times 5 100, that's about 10 kilos of feed per day. So that's all fine and well, but if you think about that from a perspective of a bale of hay, well, how much is that? How much does a bale of hay weigh? So many horse people, believe it or not, don't actually know how much the average bale weighs and therefore probably doesn't have a good idea of what is the minimum amount of, of hay that this horse needs to eat. So generally, we're talking about if the horse is only on hay and salt, presumably needs salt, um, then that's, depending on the bale of hay, that's around three, a third to three quarters, or sorry, two thirds or three quarters of a bale of hay every day. So that's if the horse is just hanging out and eating your paycheck, right? They're not doing anything else. So of the for it, of of the diet that the horse is eating irrespective of of really what work he's doing at least 50 percent needs to be hay or pasture right because that goes back to that earlier slide i showed you where the second most important nutrient is fiber um so at least 50 percent of the horse's diet on an as-fed basis should be either hay or pasture and and this hay or pasture should be available all the time so horses are are anatomically designed to be trickle feeders so their intent their their gi tract is built to take in small amounts of feed more or less continually through the day. So if your horse is on pasture or has access to hay, that hay should be available and that pasture should be available 24 hours a day. Um, so if the, the hay or the, the pasture is of good quality, really this is pretty much all that a sedentary horse needs with the exception of a little bit of trace mineral salt and obviously water. Um, so then the question becomes, well, what is good quality? So this is where we start to, to kind of think about, well, what happens as the, the pasture becomes more mature as we go through spring and into summer? And, and then what happens when, when now we're moving from pasture to forage as we typically do in the fall and the winter? 
So some of the seasonal issues that, that I'm going to address in the next um, few minutes is going to be, initially we'll talk about the spring kind of flush of grass and how that influences laminitis in horses. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that is. Um, and then we'll talk about summer and we'll look at the exercising horse. So once you impose a lot of exercise on this horse, how does that influence um, not just the, the feed intake, but also the water issue? And then when we get to autumn, we'll talk about poisonous plants and we'll talk also about how the, the, the uh, maturity of hay influences the nutrient content of that hay. And then in winter, we'll talk about some um, effects of cold acclimation and how the horse actually tolerates cold very well um, compared with some other hu uh, species like humans, for example. We're kind of wussy in the, in the winter. Well, I am anyways. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> um, okay, so grass founder. The difference between founder and laminitis, for those of you who are not, um, you know, horsey people, laminitis is inflammation in the hoof and founder is what we're looking at here is when the bone within the hoof actually rotates downwards. So un in a healthy horse, this pedal bone or coffin bone, as it's often called, should be aligned nicely here with the hoof wall. And the fact that it's rotated downwards, this happens when we get an inflammation in between that bone and the connection of the bone to the hoof wall. This is, we call this the sensitive lamina. And when we get inflammation in this sensitive lamina, this is what we call laminitis. And back here, you can't really see on this x-ray, but there's a pretty strong tendon attached to the back of this coffin bone here. And we call that the deep digital flexor tendon. And that tendon is always under constant tension. So when we have inflammation over here in, in the connections of the coffin bone to the hoof wall, these little connections start to break. And because of this constant pressure of that deep digital flexor tendon back here, this tends to rotate that coffin bone downwards. And this is a very, very painful condition. And in fact, it can, it can be either career ending and sometimes life ending for these horses. So when we have founder, that's the difference between laminitis and founder is it's this rotation that happens in the coffin bone. So one of the things that is quite well understood now is the fact that we had this relationship between spring grass and the development of, of founder. So it's not entirely understood how this relationship really works, but what we do know is that in general, the annual incidence of laminitis is around 2%. And this can more than double in the springtime. So we're looking at around 5% in the spring. So there certainly is this relationship between the presence or the appearance of this fresh grass and, and the incidence of laminitis in these horses. And so the, the, the offending participant here seems to be the sugar. So non-structural carbohydrate or sugar that's present in these fresh grasses and these spring grasses, they tend to rise in the morning and they tend to peak in the afternoon in the grass and then they decline over the evening. And the big difference here between sort of later season grass and then the early season grass is these cool season grasses, they tend to accumulate fructan as their non-structural carbohydrate, whereas the warmer season grasses, they tend to accumulate starch. And it's the fructan that seems to be the problem and seems to be the reason why we, we tend to see this increase in, in laminitis and founder in the springtime. So this little pony here, whoops, I'll go back a minute. Um, this is your classic risk factor pony, right? So a little bit fluffy, shall we say, overweight. Um, so, and, and it's, this, this pony is, is derived from breeds that tend to be very hardy and they tend to be, um, easy keepers, right? So you can feed them fresh air and they stay nice and fat. So the risk factors, um, certainly are horses with high body condition. So overweight little guys, um, and particularly those that are insulin resistant. So there certainly is also a relationship between obesity or overweight in horses and their inclination to become insulin resistant. So those horses or ponies and, and particularly uh, ponies, they, they do tend to um, 
be more vulnerable to grass founder than than their non insulin resistant counterparts. So one of the problems with these guys that are insulin resistant is that slow adaptation to grass doesn't seem to reduce the incidence of laminitis in these guys. If you have overweight horses or vulnerable horses that are not insulin resistant, you can slowly acclimate them to spring grass and they and that tends to reduce the the incidence of laminitis in these guys. But if the ponies or the horses are insulin resistant you can't do that it doesn't seem to have a, an effect so these horses really need to stay off the fresh spring grass the other risk factor here is horses with high body condition due to high levels of non-structural uh, carbohydrate uh, degrading bacteria in the hindgut so these guys with high body condition tend to have high levels of these types of bacteria in the hindgut and it's these their ability to degrade these non-structural carbohydrates that can contribute to increased incidence of laminitis in these horses and then also ponies draft horses and horses that evolve from regions with poor nutrition these are the breeds of horses that tend to be easy keepers right so they tend to to really require relatively fewer calories in order to maintain a healthy body condition than horses like you know arabians for example or or thoroughbreds these these horses tend to be a little bit harder keepers so the easy keepers the the um the overweight horses and also the insulin resistant horses these are the ones that tend to have the highest incidence of grass founder so what can you do? Um, provided that the horse or the pony is not insulin resistant, you can slowly acclimate horses to grass in the springtime. So put them out for you know an hour a day to, and slowly increase that amount of time until they're adapted, excuse me, to the, uh, to the spring grass. If you do have susceptible horses or ponies, you can just allow them to graze at night, right? Because um, the, the non-structural carbohydrates tend to increase during the day and peak in the afternoon and then decline because obviously these, these plants are producing these sugars based on their exposure to sunlight. So you can allow these susceptible horses to graze at night and you'll have uh, less risk of development of grass founder. Shaded grass, for the same reason, shaded grass tends to have lower non-structural carbohydrate than non-shaded grass. So if you have a shady paddock, then that can be a good way to, um, to allow these horses to graze without exposing them to excess risk of developing grass founder. So really vulnerable horses or insulin resistant horses really ideally should be kept in a dry paddock. So a paddock that doesn't have any forage and fed only hay. These, that seems to be really the only way to, uh, to manage the, the insulin resistant horses. So that's springtime and you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a downer because I don't know about you, but for me, spring is like, it, the world comes alive again. And of course the horses, they love to go out into the pastures and graze. Um, but this is something that we need to be very sensitive to, uh, particularly if you've got horses that are vulnerable to laminitis. Okay, so we're going to move on to the summer now. So if you're, uh, you know, a horsey person, then summer is your season, right? So we we tend to, you know, we'll go out and we start to exercise and, and the horses will many times will be coming into some pretty serious training and competing in the summer. So there are a number of things that will happen as a result of that. So we've got a lot of adaptations that are happening during the summertime, particularly when we're coming out of a season when maybe the horse isn't exercising as much um, because of the cold in the winter. Um, and now we're starting to really impose high intensity exercise on these horses. And so we'll be doing a lot of adaptations of tissues, right? So we're adapting muscle, we're adapting bones, we're adapting tendons and ligaments. Um, and in fact, the horse is one of the fastest of the traditional um, athletic mammals. So I, I really like this little picture because this is along the bottom here, you can see this is speed in meters per second. And here's us humans, right? So we're, we're uh, you know, we're about on par with a camel. And uh, so we, we can go at our top speed. We're looking at around 10 to 11 meters per second. Um, on a good day, we can outrun a camel. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, we have here the Greyhound. So the Greyhound at its top speed can get up to around between 19 to 22 meters per second. But then the quarter horse, 
is over here. So he can get up to speeds of around 25 meters per second. So the horse is, is a really an extraordinary athlete. And so we really take advantage of that when we, you know, we take these animals and we put them into some of these very high intensity training paradigms. So whether we're talking about, you know, race training or dressage training or show jumping or all of these myriad of different things that we can do. But when we do that, we need to understand that there is a, a nutritional cost to that. There is an energetic expense to it. So if we take that same feeding paradigm that we talked about at the very beginning here, where uh, we're feeding just 2% of body mass, then in many cases, those horses will start to lose condition. So when you take a horse that was previously sedentary, and now we're going to start putting that horse into heavy work, the dry matter intake requirements can increase to up to three and a half percent of body weight. So if we look at originally what we talked about, 2% of body mass, so that original 10 kilos of feed that that horse needed for maintenance can go up to 15 kilos of feed, right, during heavy work. So this, this can be quite a significant jump. Uh, and where is this increase going to come from, right? So at least 50% uh, still has to come from forage. So just like before, where I mentioned that, that even a sedentary horse, at least 50% has to come from forage. That doesn't change when the horse is in high intensity exercise. So, but one of the problems is that in order to increase the nutrient density of, of the, you may need to increase the nutrient density of the diet because the horse may not be able to eat enough forage in order to maintain a healthy body condition. So in those cases, you may want to increase calories by things in addition to increasing the amount of forage. So this can be done using uh, carbohydrate, but you need to be careful with this because horses are not designed to eat large amounts of carbohydrate, right? We kind of mentioned that earlier when we were talking about laminitis. And that's no different if the carbohydrate either comes from, from fresh pasture or if it comes from concentrates and grains. Those can also cause laminitis in horses. So if you're increasing the amount of carbohydrate that you're feeding the horse, so you need to be very careful. And ideally, we suggest not feeding more than two pounds of a grain type feeding in a single feeding. If you're gonna feed more than that, you need to split it into more than one feeding. And that will help reduce the risk of carbohydrate overload in these horses. Another way of increasing calories is by increasing fat. But again, you have to be careful here too because horses don't have a gallbladder like we do, right? So we can, you know, take a, a notion to run off to Timmy's and buy ourselves a nice big fat delicious donut and we have a gallbladder that will help us to to kind of inject enough bile into the the small intestine that we can digest the fat horses don't have that option right so what they do is the liver in a horse is continually making bile and it's continually depositing that that fluid into the upper small intestine and the amount of bile that the horse produces is commensurate with the amount of fat that he's adapted to so if you're going to increase the amount of fat in the horse's diet, you need to do it slowly. So slowly, gradually increase that fat. Um, now, ideally, depending on kind of the type of work that the horse is doing, sort of the top end of, of fat content that the horse can tolerate is somewhere between 10 to 12 percent. Now, if you if we're talking about Arabian type endurance horses, there are some of those horses that can adapt to much higher amounts of fat. So I think I've seen it as high as 20 percent fat, which is extremely high. And in most cases, um, horses really can't tolerate that amount of fat. But irrespective of, of kind of where you end up, you need to get there slowly. So slowly over the a period of you know a week to two weeks depending on how much fat you're going to introduce into the horse's diet um so that the the liver can keep up and make sure that enough bile is being produced to, to digest the fat so irrespective of what we put into the horse in order to make sure that he can exercise one of the things that's going to come out is heat so one of the major byproducts of exercise is heat production so for every uh, um, unit of ATP that's being um, consumed, only 25% of that will go to kinetic activities, 
So that means 75% of the energy that's, it, that's associated with ATP consumption is, is essentially released as heat. So if you've got a horse that's exercising, particularly in hot, humid conditions, that horse is going to start really storing heat. So what are some of the ways that you can help horses deal with this heat load? So you can do the cooling with, with cold water, right? So repeated applications of cold water. Um, shading will also help. Uh, wind or cooling fans. Don't cover your horse with a blanket. So many people will do that. And ironically, they call it a cooler. But in fact, it's a warmer. So um, if, the if it's hot, humid conditions and you're trying to cool down the horse, don't put a blanket on the horse. Um, the other big thing you need to do if you've got these horses that are exercising, particularly in hot, humid conditions, is you need to be able to prevent dehydration. So electrolyte supplementation is a really good way to do that. Now, don't be fooled into thinking, well, if I'm giving electrolytes to the horse, then therefore that means that um, the electrolytes somehow hydrate the horse. No, they don't. I promise you they, that that will not happen. The only way that electrolytes is going to help keep your horse hydrated is if you provide them with enough fresh, clean water, right? So, um, so the idea with the electrolytes is that they they will when when the horse sweats, the, the horse is sweating a very concentrated sweat. So horses lose a lot of electrolytes when they sweat. Unlike us, we actually don't lose anywhere near as many electrolytes as horses do. Our sweat tends to be quite dilute, but horses' sweat is very concentrated with electrolytes. So when we exercise and as we sweat, the concentration of electrolytes in our blood goes up because we're losing the water portion of our blood. So that's essentially concentrating the electrolytes. And it's that concentrated um, concentration of electrolytes that, that stimulates that thirst response for us, for humans. Now, horses don't get the same stimulus as we do because when they sweat, they, they essentially sweat an isotonic sweat, which means it's the same concentration of electrolytes in sweat as in blood. So as they sweat and they lose water, they're also losing electrolytes. So if you were to provide just water to rehydrate these horses, you can imagine what's going to happen. So the horse is going to drink the water. The water is going to go into the total body water compartment. And what's it going to do to the electrolyte concentration in blood? It's actually going to cause that concentration to go down, right? And then the kidney will detect that as a water overload and will actually start to cause the horse to urinate and get rid of the fluid. So in a better strategy for making sure a horse rehydrates when you give him water is to give him water with electrolytes so that that electrolyte concentration between the water that the horse is drinking and the electrolyte concentration in blood is essentially the same so that will help hold that water in the total body water compartment okay so that's summer now we're moving on to autumn so now typically as we we kind of move through the summertime and we start to smell that lovely smell of fresh hay that's literally my favorite smell in the world um but there are some some consequences to switching from a pasture diet to a hay diet and those consequences are going to depend on the quality of the hay that's actually being produced so this little slide here is just to show you what happens with these are different types of hay over on this side and what i've got on here is the percent of crude protein and then this is acid detergent fiber so this is essentially the fiber portion of the of the hay and you can see with all of these different types the the crude protein from the first week over here to the seventh week, we go from about 26% to around 12% for crude protein. And for acid detergent fiber, we're going from 18% all the way up to over 33. So this is a very consistent pattern with all of these different types of hay. So as the hay becomes more mature, it loses crude protein content and increases the, the acid detergent fiber. So, which means the digestibility of the hay is gonna go down as will the crude protein content of that hay. So this has some pretty significant um, implications if you're thinking about, well, when am I going to harvest the hay, right? So 
the most important determinant to hay quality is, is how mature the plant is when you harvest that plant. And the problem is the yield in particularly in first cut is going to be a lot higher if your plant maturity is higher. So there's this little bit of a trade off, right? So if you leave it a little longer in the field, you're going to get more hay, but that hay is going to be of less nutrient um, quality. So there's a little bit of a balance off here. And one of the things to consider is that many horses are actually overfed protein. So second cut hay, the protein content is somewhere 15 to 20%. And that's because second cut hay typically has more alfalfa or legume in it than, um, than first cut hay. First cut hay tends to be more of the, the grassy type hay. So if you look at the nutrient content or sorry, nutrient requirements of horses, horses only need around 7% protein in their overall diet. So in general, we horse people tend to overfeed protein. So in fact, it, it may be not such a terrible thing if you have a little bit later harvest of your first cut hay, because that will give you more um, yield but again you got to be a little bit careful so you don't want to you don't want to go too far because then your hay becomes not very digestible right because your adf is going to go up so good quality so not over mature so good quality first cut hay is typically preferred as a forage for horses under most circumstances right so some exceptions might be your lactating mares or your late gestation mares um, or horses that are actively growing so we're talking weanlings yearlings those kinds of things so these guys might benefit from a little bit more protein in their hay so this is, might be a situation where you might want to either feed um, you know mix in some second cut hay with your first cut hay so you can increase the protein um, but typically first cut hay, first cut hay good quality first cut hay is really all the horses need um, so just a little visual here for those of you who uh, don't know what the difference is between first and second cut so this is a very classical first cut hay so you can see this is a little bit mature so these little heads here they're now seeding out so this plant is, is now into the reproductive stage um, so this is a sort of a, a more mature but it looks a nice clean um, first cut hay whereas over here you can see there's some alfalfa in here um, and that it tends to be kind of stockier a little a more of a coarse type hay but again this is a more a, typically a higher protein content than first cut okay so now we're going to move into the autumn so there's the autumn in terms of poisonous plants so generally we tend to see more of the problems here in poisonous plants in the autumn because some of the leaves that fall from the trees are, are more toxic when they're wilted. Okay, so that's one reason. And also the moisture content falls, right? So th that means if there are toxins in the plants, then these toxins tend to become concentrated. The other problem is that healthy pasture tends to be diminished, right? So the, the, it's not growing as fast. So a lot of the horses are, a lot of the pastures are overgrazed. So normally horses will avoid poisonous plants if they're in a healthy pasture. So you can see this little guy here, he's trying to get some grass here that's behind this buttercup. And buttercup is a toxic plant to horses. Now, again, most of the time they won't eat it unless they're actually starving. Um, but uh, but this does tend to be more of an issue in in the fall so here's a list um that i got from the omafra website of the 10 most poisonous plants in uh, in our area so there's a few of them here i've highlighted red maple because i'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second um but generally remember this that as long as the horses have access either to healthy pasture or good quality hay, in most cases, they're not gonna eat these plants. Um, so generally, they don't present a very serious health hazard, as long as the horse, again, has this, uh, has good quality forage. So I am gonna pick a little bit on red maple um, for a couple of reasons, because we do tend to have a lot of red maples around. And because they're really quite beautiful trees, um, you can see this little scene here is quite picturesque, right? So you've got these beautiful colors here and the nice pretty horses in the pasture. So it looks all lovely and tranquil. Um, it is 
kind of it's important to point out that fresh leaves are not toxic. So the only time you really have an issue with red maple is in the autumn um, when the leaves tend to wilt and they tend to fall off the trees, right? So, and in fact, they're quite toxic when you get to that point. So a horse can consume less than a pound of dried um, red maple leaves and that can be fatal. So imagine if you've got a horse that's in a, essentially a starvation paddock where they have really nothing else to eat, this is the time that these kinds of problems become a serious issue because if they're starving, they will eat these wilted leaves that fall off the trees. So what happens to these horses when they eat these plants? Um, it's a condition called Heinz body anemia. So essentially what happens is there's, there's a, a compound in red blood cells that will Essentially, it, it will um, solidify, we can put it that way. And so you can, the way you can imagine it is, is um, if you take a fresh egg and you crack it and you add heat, remember that fresh egg starts off kind of runny and slippery. And then when you add heat, it kind of becomes very hard. And that's essentially what happens to the hemoglobin inside the red blood cells when horses eat large amounts of uh, red maple. And so what happens then is these red blood cells die and when they die, the red blood cell count in these horses essentially goes down and down and down to a point where they become critical. And, and so this can happen relatively quickly. You'd be surprised how quickly this can uh, precipitate. So um, if you do have red maple trees around the horse paddocks, the, the best solution is either to fence them off with some temporary electric fencing in the fall um, or simply move the horses out of that paddock because they can be, it can be a very serious problem. A less serious problem is buttercups. Um, so the toxic principle is a little bit different in that compared with what we just talked about with red maple, because the toxic principle is actually in the fresh plant. So where again, where we have problems with buttercup um, toxicity in, in horses is in starvation paddocks. So when the horses don't have enough alternative forage to eat, then that's really the time that they'll start to graze on buttercups. Um, but the thing about buttercups is the horses don't actually have to eat them in order to be exposed to the toxins. So the, the thing about buttercups is they are a topical irritant. So what ends up happening is, is you get a condition called buttercup burn. And this can happen on uh, hooves, sort of around the coronet band and along the back of the pastern, and sometimes also on the muzzle of the horse. Um, essentially, it'll it'll kind of burn the the skin and it, it looks it looks a little bit like sunburn if any of you have ever seen sunburn in horses it's like little scabs over the nose and you'll see the little scabs along the, the pastern as well if the horse does eat the buttercup because it's in a starvation paddock this can be a lot more serious and it can cause kidney and liver damage and so, and some some cases colic um, and it is as i say a very common poisoning in horses in starvation paddocks last one I'm going to talk about here is St. John's wort and the reason I'm bringing this one up is because there are a lot of medicinal plants which are oh, sorry a lot of um, medicinal plant products which contain St. John's wort and the reason for that is there's a, um, a really interesting compound in this plant which is a, a pretty effective anti-anxiety drug so a lot of the products that are on the shelf that are marketed for horses as a like a calming agent oftentimes will have this plant in them. Um, and so the, the problem with it is that, that there's a, a compound in this plant called hypericin. And hypericin is what we call a phototoxic agent. So what that means is essentially it, it removes the horse's innate protection from UV light. So what happens is this kind of situation. So this horse was given a, a product that um, that is that contains St. John's Ward, and essentially he now has pretty severe sunburn. Um, so if you do, it's not. I'm not suggesting that you avoid products that have this plant in them, but if you are feeding this type of product, um, then you want to make sure that you protect the horse from, from sunburn. So whether that's in, you know, turning him out only at night or putting, you know, sunscreen on vulnerable areas like white blazes on the nose, um, that's another strategy. So just be aware that, that this plant will potentially cause this problem. It also grows like 
everywhere around here. So you'll see it in hedgerows and, and in fields and pastures. It's, it's all over the place. So it's a very common plant. Um, and so if you do have a horse that all of a sudden is, seems to be very vulnerable to uh, sunburn, you might want to go out and have a look in your pastures and see what's uh, going on in there. Okay, moving now to winter. So this, the reason I, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about in here, um, I get a lot of people concerned about the welfare of horses in winter. And I can tell you this, horses actually adapt to extreme cold a lot better than they adapt to extreme heat. So they have a lot of mechanisms that really help them to protect themselves against extreme cold weather. And really, they change their physiology in order to do that as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of those adaptations are. So in terms of winter feeding, so the question is, do horses eat more in winter? So if you were to go and look in the literature with this question in mind, what you're going to find is, no, they don't. Whereas, you know, you might think, well, it's cold and, and you know, well, the horse must have to eat more in order to, to deal with the, the cold. So if the answer is no, well, then why is that? Because we, we do know that dry matter intake in wild horses will change over the season, but it's not changing in the way you might think. So, in fact, it peaks in the autumn and it's lowest intake in the winter. So... And, and if you think about kind of the, the availability of food that might be available to wild horses, this kind of might make a bit of sense to you, right? Because why would the physiology of the horse say, okay, I'm going to need more feed intake now, despite the fact that feed provision or availability of feed is actually at its lowest so what happens is that we, we do see this, this peak in intake happening in the autumn and, this, and it drops way off in the wintertime. And if you take it now out of the wild horse situation and you put it into the situation of some of our actively racing uh, thoroughbreds. So if you take these thoroughbred racehorses under constant exercise and constant management, they tend to have a higher body condition in the fall and the winter. Right. So that speaks to the fact that, well, their metabolism is actually slowing down in the fall and the winter because from a from a evolutionary perspective, they're anatomically and evolutionary programmed to actually require less feed in the wintertime in order to maintain body condition. So if you've got constant body condition and, and sorry, constant exercise and constant management, so availability of feed stays the same, the body condition is actually higher in the fall and the winter um, than it is in the spring and the summer. So then the question is, okay, well, do they eat more, winter, more in winter? Well, no, but now the question is, well, should they eat more in winter? So if you look at the Omafra website, you're going to find that they report that horses in minus 40 degrees centigrade, so really cold, um, need approximately 2% more energy than horses that are maintained at minus 15 degrees centigrade. So you might ask the question, well, why is this different from wild horses? And the answer to that in, in, you know, for me, when, I, when I'm reading this and I'm trying to reconcile the differences between kind of what the wild horse does versus what we do in domestic practice and, and think about the fact that, well, we don't want our horses to lose body condition, right? So in the wild, these wild horses, even though they will eat a lot less, their body condition will gradually decline over the course of the winter. So by the time they get into spring, they do tend to have a, a lower body condition. The other thing that, that is happening in, in our uh, domestic horses is in many cases, we are requiring them to continue normal exercise, right? So they're gonna be uh, you know, training if they're a racehorse or, or, or you know, even weekend warriors going out on the trail, they still have that, that imposed exercise they wouldn't necessarily have if they're a wild horse. So we don't want our horses to lose condition over the winter. So then for that reason, you may want to increase um, their energy intake over the winter. So there's a couple of references here. Um, and by the way, I didn't mention this, but anybody who's watching this, if you would like to have copies of these slides after the fact, I'm totally happy to do that for you. <laughs> 
Okay, so cold acclimation. So how does the horse deal with these changes in in uh, in temperature? So we when we think about how a horse acclimates to the cold, we want to think about the lowest critical temperature. Now, I don't mean the temperature at which your horse will freeze solid and die. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the lowest temperature in the thermoneutral zone. So what this means is the zone within which the horse has to neither actively get rid of or, or generate heat. So he's thermoneutral, right? So the, the lower critical temperature is the lowest temperature at which the horse does not have to actively generate heat in order to maintain his, his body temperature. Now, the interesting thing about the lower critical temperature is that it depends on the temperature to which the horse is acclimated. So if you have a horse that's in summertime in, you know, Guelph, and he has no blanket in the summer, and then he's slowly allowed to acclimate as the temperature gradually goes down in the fall and then goes down again in the winter, then that thermoneutral zone is going to slide along with the temperature of the, of the environment that the horse is living in. So the, the lowest critical temperature in the summer is going to be a lot higher than the lower critical temperature in the winter time if the horse is allowed to acclimate to the changes in temperature. So in, in general, five degrees centigrade is considered the lowest critical temperature in the, in the summer, right? So when the horse has a summer winter coat, a summer winter coat, summer coat, um, and then minus 15 degrees centigrade is the lower critical temperature in the winter. Now that doesn't mean that at minus 16, your horse freezes solid and dies. What it means is then the horse has to actively generate mechanisms which will generate body heat, right? So he'll do things like he'll shiver or he'll walk around or you'll often see horses in extremely cold temperatures will actually be playing, right? They're playing with each other. So this is a behavioral strategy to, to increase core body temperature. So the most important consideration when you're housing horses in very cold climates is not whether or not they have a blanket under most circumstances, because in most circumstances, they actually don't need one. Um, provided that the horse has protection from wind and wet, so that means a good shelter, and a shelter that they'll go into, right? So sometimes you can provide the most beautiful shelter, and the horse will not go in it. What be, maybe because there's other horses in there, and maybe your horse is low on the totem pole, um, but as long as the horse actually will use the shelter, and the horse has adequate calories from feeds that have a high heat increment, so what that means is when the horse is digesting the feed, it's generating heat. Um, hay is an excellent uh, example of a, of a feed with high heat increment. As long as you have that, then in most cases, your horse doesn't need a blanket. Where you may want to put a blanket on is a horse that has low body condition or a horse that, um, as I mentioned earlier, won't go into the shelter because it's timid. Um, an older horse, you may, it's like if there's some vulnerability there that you want to protect, that might be a good time to, to use a blanket. But in most cases, if the horse has healthy body condition, has access to free choice, good quality forage, and a good shelter, in most cases, they don't need a blanket. Summarize, um, horses really are very pretty well equipped to adapt, adapt to the changing seasons and the climates. Um, so you might want to alter your feeding strategies, however, um, to include good quality hay, make sure that hay is available 24-7, um, and some key nutritional considerations which are, are sort of seasonally dependent um, that we've talked about is laminitis in the spring, we've talked about heat tolerance and hydration in the summer, uh, we've talked about changing from pasture to hay in, and poisonous plants in, in the fall, and then cold tolerance in the winter. So I thank you so much for your attention. I hope you've uh, found this interesting and um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the lecture series. Thanks so much.